We started a new sermon series just last week uh, entitled Neighboring. It's built around this book by Jay Pathak and Dave Runyon called The Art of Neighboring, Building Genuine Relationships Right Outside Your Door. And the book suggests that the best way to share faith is through actual relationships with actual people. What do you know? And um, one of the tools that we handed out last weekend is this uh, neighborhood block sheet and invited people to use this as a way to get to know their neighbors. And I wondered how it was going, starting to fill in some of those blocks as you get to know the people who live right outside your door. And I wonder what the next steps are for us as a church as we get to know our neighbors here in this community and beyond. Would you pray with me? Holy, holy, holy God. May the words of our mouths and meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock, our refuge, our savior, our redeemer. Amen. Well, over the Christmas holidays, my husband and I went to an electronics store, Best Buy, out in Woodbridge, and when we went in, my husband had one of those Thursday throwback sorts of moments, and he looked at me and said, where are the CDs? <laughs> and I looked at my wonderful, anachronistic husband, and I couldn't believe where his head had gone. He said, there were rows and rows and racks of CDs here. Where have they gone? He said, I miss them. And then he went off on a tangent. What happened to eight-track tapes and albums and 45s and cassette tapes? Oh, I miss them so much. And I said, well, I'm sorry. You can't go back. Life goes on <laughs> whether we want it to or not. And it's a new day in music. <laughs> Change is hard. Change is uh, something that is difficult for all of us, particularly for my Andy Griffith Mayberry loving husband. Sorry, honey. <laughs> we can long for the good old days so deeply that we can get stuck there sometimes. Stuck wishing we had a store that was still full of rows and rows of cassette tapes, no less. Stuck wishing that things were the way they used to be. Stuck missing an old home or an old way of life, but one of the eternal truths is that life goes on and we can't go back. And things don't stay the same whether we wish that they would or not. And change is hard when it comes to churches too. Perhaps you've noticed churches can be one of the last institutions to begin to change and people in church can long for the good old days whatever that means and we can get stuck wishing we were back in the 70s or the 80s or the 90s and people in churches will often talk about the glory days of some former pastor or some former big event that we used to have and remembering days when the United Methodist women and United Methodist men and certain Sunday school classes were bursting at the seams. I have heard those wistful longing words in every church that I have served in the last 31 years. Change is hard and change is real and we fight it. But I'm not sure why we do sometimes do you know that over 125,000 churches have closed in the last 20 years alone? And only 2% of churches nationwide are growing, 2%. 80 to 85% of churches in the United States are declining, and the rest of them are trying to struggle to keep their doors open and maintain. Perhaps all of that would signal to us that it is time to change as church. 
and that churches cannot keep doing ministry the same way they've always done it for years and years. Because what connected the gospel with people 30, 20, 10 years ago doesn't necessarily meet people where they are anymore. And what does that mean? And that can be hard for all of us, especially for pastors, and especially when we tend to love or romanticize the way things used to be, when our memories tend to skew things in the best possible way, and maybe we don't remember things exactly the way they were. Ministry at its best is always still imperfect. And so we can choose to do ministry differently. But in order to do that, we often have to recognize first the need for change and the need to learn to ask new questions of an old but never static gospel that we find in Jesus Christ. So as we learn to ask these new questions, may we ask them in our day and time and context for ministry as it always means that we can't go back and for my wonderful anachronistic husband it means that you got to learn to buy digital music these days <laughs> whether we want to or not <laughs> the text we read today in Jeremiah talks about being an, un an uncomfortable place of needed change for life and faith and ministry as they are frustrated by that and don't want it. It is a passage about embracing a new day and time, a new neighborhood, a new context for living out faith and life. It is an uncomfortable passage when we understand the context. And there's far more to it than we have time to unpack in a short sermon. But I want to unpack a little bit of it. It's written to people who want to go back to the way things used to be and live there when that is sadly no longer possible for them. And so to wistful ears, the words of Jeremiah sound harsh. The people are in exile in this story. Their nation, the southern kingdom of Judah, was overtaken by the Babylonians, and these persons have been forced to leave their homes and live in Babylon, in a place they do not want to live beside people they do not want for neighbors. And what they want is to go back home to the way things used to be. And Jeremiah writes to them to tell them that that is no longer possible and they need to adjust. That new life will come by God's grace, Jeremiah promises, but not by going backward and not by reliving glory days, but by building a new life in the new here and now. New life will come by going forward, Jeremiah writes, and embracing the change. It's a sobering letter, one that tells the people to dig in and get to work and not look back. Jeremiah writes, build houses here and live in them now. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Grow your families here and seek what is best, not for you, but for the people beside whom you live and pray for them. For in their welfare and well-being, you will find your own. Meaning that if your neighbor is able to thrive, you will be too. So live fully right where you are in the here and now, Jeremiah says. Even if it's not where you want to be. Jeremiah says we're meant to live as a symbiotic community with each of us silking the welfare of those around us more than we seek our own. Community, he says, is meant to be like, an example I thought of was that three sisters garden, which is a tradition of the indigenous peoples of the Americas. Some of my friends grow their gardens this way. They have corn and beans and squash, and each item in the garden does something to fulfill the needs of the whole and help it to survive and thrive. 
And so the corn grows up straight and gives the beans a place to climb and grow. And the squash provides shade and mulch and natural protection from predators with their prickly leaves. And the beans take the nitrogen from the air and give it to the corn and the squash that need it. It's like a model neighborhood and community. Jean Venier, the founder of the L'Arche community, says that a community is only a community when most of the people in it have made that passage from the community for me to me for the community. When most of the people have moved from what's in it for me to how can I best contribute to serving others who live there. And that's where Jesus takes us in our passage from Matthew today, in which loving God fully and loving our actual neighbors and loving ourselves are parts of the same whole. It is that symbiotic nature of fully living a life of faith in context, that we love God through how we love and live with our neighbors. And we love our neighbors through how we love and live with God. And we love God and our neighbors through how we love and live with ourselves. Through a love that is commitment and action, not feeling or sentimentality, but love that is grounded and real and full and messy. What does all of that mean for a church? It means loving our neighborhoods. It means loving our neighbors in places like Fort Hunt and Mount Vernon and Waynewood and Bellevue and Holland Meadows and Gum Spring and Bucknell and Riverside and Holland Hall and everywhere in between. And it means learning what matters to the people who live there and meeting them in it outside the walls of the church. The old pattern for ministry was an attraction mode. So we do something, make a, some spectacle. We do something grand that draws people in so that they will come. This new way of thinking about ministry is community-based so that we go outside the walls of the church to where people already are rather than staying here hoping they will come of their own accord. It's living faith and discipleship outside the walls of the church. And going into our prayer closets with questions like, what does the gospel need to look like here, Lord? How do we put skin and bones on it here? What does the gospel need to sound like and act like and look like in these neighborhoods, in our streets, in these businesses? What about it? Aldersgate is meant to be a conduit into the community through which we live out our faith. It's not to be a static place where we come and stay, but it's more like a base of operation so that we pass through and then we go right back out to serve and express our faith by moving out into the community to live out our discipleship there as part of God's plan for transforming our neighborhoods and our lives by the love and grace of God. Pope Francis has a great quote about it. I prefer a church, he writes, which is bruised, hurting, and dirty because it has been out on the streets rather than a church which is unhealthy from clinging to its own security. What does doing ministry like that look like here? Honestly, I don't know. I'm still new. Pastor Randy is still new. And we're trying to figure that out. Is it doing a small group up at DRP or Bellhaven Pizzeria, it's called now? Is that what it is? Is it having a booth at the farmer's market? Is it doing more outside in neighborhoods, building partnerships with businesses like Primo's or Bread and Water? What does it look like? I bet you have ideas. 
as you have lived here, some of you for several years and some of you for decades, and you know this place a lot better than just the two of us do. So we'd love to hear your ideas and invite you to be part of our new community engagement team and ministry because we want to do this thing together through the direction and by the grace of God that we live out our discipleship outside the walls of the church. One example of what this can look like is from the last church that I served. I was sent to a small town out on the northern neck to a dying church. And so we started praying those questions. What does the gospel need to look like here? How do we put skin on it? How do we get to know our neighbors and what their needs and challenges are and what matters most to them? Because we won't know unless we ask and build relationships there. So that's what we did. We got outside the walls of the church. We took prayer walks in our neighborhoods and built real relationships with our real neighbors, one on one on one on one. And what we found out that mattered the most to the persons who lived there were the local schools. And we found out that, that baseball was pretty important and that the community mattered a lot. So that's where we went. So we went into the local schools and took goodie bags and said thank you to custodians and cafeteria workers and the administration and the teachers. And we went again and again to say thank you. And then we went to the little league ball fields and we sponsored a ball team and we had a blessing of the bats at the kickoff of the new season every summer. And then we took goodie bags and thank you notes to postal carriers and people who were part of social work and people who were part of local businesses right in our community. And after a big snowstorm, we went to the electrical line workers and said thank you for getting us back online along with some brownies to it's easier to say thank you with brownies. <laughs> and then we had a booth at the county fair. We had a lot of fun building these relationships. And one of the things we tried was rather than having our Easter egg hunt at church, we had it at the town park. So that the usual seven kids who always showed up we're surprised that a hundred kids came to our Easter egg hunt that year and we were not ready for them. And it was so much fun to do that together. That's what it looked like there as we built relationships in the community and God's grace and the gospel came alive in new ways and that church began to grow. But what does it look like here? Because it's different here. And people have long commutes and work long hours and we're near a military base and military families do life a little differently because they have to. And so what does it look like here? We want to know and we want to partner in this ministry together and spark conversations about what it looks like to live as a disciple of Jesus Christ in 2020 in Waynewood and Fort Hunt and Mount Vernon and Gum Spring and Holland Hall and all those neighborhoods in between. How do we commit to our neighbors here? What are their hopes and fears? What matters most to them? What are the challenges? And what does it look like to meet people in the midst of them by the grace and mercy of God? What's our next step? Help us prayerfully to discern and figure that out. Because relationships are mostly, a, that's ministry. Ministry is about building relationships and sharing one to one to one. Eighty-five percent of people who come to church for the first time come because of the invitation of a friend. So let's keep building relationships. And that can start by filling out these block maps. It can start at a trash can in the street talking to a neighbor. It can start at a bus stop when you're waiting or the metro when you're going into the commute in the mornings. It can start when you tell a neighbor you'll be in prayer for them at the loss of someone they love. 
the book that Pastor Randy and I are reading says that we move from being strangers to acquaintances to being having actual relationships with actual neighbors. That is nothing new. And long before that book was written, that's the way Jesus had been doing ministry a couple thousand years ago. So let's try it. Let's build relationships one to one to one to one by the grace and mercy of God that we might share the gospel with real people in real places. Jeremiah tells us it's possible to do just that wherever we are planted and that we are called to do it. So let's dig in and live fully right where we are because honestly, we can't go back. So let's not resist this time for change and move forward and embrace what lies ahead by loving God and loving our neighbors, our real next door neighbors and sharing the gospel by who we are and how we do this thing called faith. So may we meet others where they already are by the love and grace of God in community together. Amen.